The 12th lesson as we've been looking at the fundamentals of the faith and we've been uh, looking at here recently the avenues of worship and one of the avenues of worship it is our giving in worship as we just did a moment ago we give back a portion of, from all the blessings which God has given us and we give that to uh, the Lord as we offer it up uh, during uh, that time and is used as we'll see here this morning for uh, the work of uh, the church. This morning I want to show what the Bible says about giving. And we think about giving, we know sometimes we talk about giving, you hear people, especially of the denominational world, use the word tithe. Uh, <coughs> excuse me. Uh, that is not uh, the same type of thing we're talking about this morning. Tithe is something that's actually referenced in the Old Testament, and it was uh, something that we do not uh, do today. We offer up, uh, as we, as we'll see in a moment, as we prosper. We do not tithe in the sense we read about uh, there in the Old Testament. You know, anytime you talk about something that affects, maybe you might say, our pocketbook, it's not always something we enjoy. Uh, whether you're talking about doing repairs, you're talking about going to the doctor and having to pay for a, a procedure, it's not something we enjoy because uh, having to pay for something is, uh, could be uh, very difficult for us. Many times you talk about financial matters, it can be very difficult, but we have to realize when we come together to worship God in spirit and truth that we give as part of our worship, and it should not be something that should be uh, sensitive to us. And so this morning we'll be discussing giving, and we must remember that as we give, that we want to make sure, as we do any act of worship, that it is pleasing to God. And so let's first begin with our first point this morning, how all things are God's, and we must be faithful stewards of those things. You notice there in 1 Corinthians 10 and verse 26, we find the words, for the earth is the Lord's and all its fullness. Everything belongs to God. Everything we receive in this life is a blessing given to us from God. It can come in the form of our job, which thus provides our livelihood, thus providing for our homes, thus providing for our vehicles, for our food, for our families, for our clothing, all those types of things, and it all comes back to how those things come from God as a blessing from God. Paul recognizes this when he says, For the earth is the Lord's and all its fullness. Everything on the earth belongs to God. And us being on this earth, we're able to enjoy the benefits of living in such a place that's designed for us to be able to live, survive, and not just survive, but also in many ways to flourish as well. I think it's also good for us to remember that we came into this world with nothing. In fact, Paul mentions this to Timothy in 1 Timothy 6 and verse 7, when he says, But we brought nothing into this world, and it is certain we can carry nothing out. It's sad sometimes when we have those who really have the problem, not with the coming into the world with nothing, but the idea they cannot carry nothing out, uh, especially if we look at those uh, in the world, we know that they act and live sometimes and work in such a way and have an attitude towards uh, money as if it's something they can take with them. And so we must remember that, as Paul mentions here, we came into this world with nothing and we're going to leave this world with nothing in terms of material possessions. Notice with me Matthew chapter 16. As we are encouraged and reminded that we are God's stewards. In Matthew 16, beginning in verse 24, the Bible says, Then Jesus said to his disciples, If anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. For whoever desires to, lose, to save his life will lose it, but whoever, desires, but whoever loses his life for my sake uh, will find it. For what profit is it to a man if he gains the whole world or and lose his own soul, or what will a man gain, or give rather, in exchange for his soul? We look at this verse, we want to recognize how we are to be good stewards. And the first thing we want to recognize, we back up for a moment to verse 24 and 25, 
when he tells us, he talks about how if we want, what anyone wants to come after him, we have to be willing to give up certain things. And really what he's talking about here is to put Christ first. He says in verse 24, If anyone desires to come after me, that is, if anyone desires to be a follower of Christ, we must deny ourselves. He says, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. That is, to literally to put, up, put Christ first and to begin living the Christian life, to begin living that life of obedience, following him. For whoever desires, he says in verse 25, to save his life will lose it. There are some today who do not become Christians because they desire to preserve a certain way of life that is contrary to God, and for that reason they will lose their life. And verse 25, he goes on to say, But whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. When we give up our old way of life and put Christ first, we will find eternal life in Christ because we are obedient to him. And then he continues in verse 26 by really looking at a little more closely about what we're talking about today when it comes to giving. He says, For what profit is it to a man if he gains the whole world and loses his own soul? If we could have everything in the world under our power, have great wealth, and Christ is asking, What profit does that do if you lose your own soul? A rich man who is lost is in worse shape than a poor man who is following God. We must be remembered that we have to put our focus upon heavenly riches and not on earthly things that are temporary. He says in verse 26, Or what will a man give in exchange for his soul? Well, we know that man will sacrifice a lot of things and put God somewhere else besides first in order to please themselves. And by doing so, they give up their soul. And that's what Christ is referencing here in verse 26 when he says, What will a man give in exchange for his soul? You know, people, we think about the question, what are some reasons that people have gone to eternal damnation for? What has caused them to go on to eternal damnation? Sadly, some of that is because they, have a, they don't have a proper regard for wealth. They don't have a proper understanding of what it means to, to give and to worship God and to give in our worship to God and those types of things. And so for that very reason, they will lose their soul. Paul also encourages us here in 1 Corinthians 4 and verse 2 that we are to be good stewards, that is, faithful stewards. He says in 1 Corinthians 4 and verse 2, Moreover, it is required in stewards that one be found faithful. If you are a steward, a, a person who is entrusted with things, we are to be faithful with those things. We are entrusted with certain activities or things we are to be over, then we should be faithful in those things. When it comes to our physical blessings, we should be good stewards of them. That is, we make sure that we put first things first. In fact, Vance had a lesson on that years ago. I still remember it, obviously. It's all about putting first things first. And that is what we are supposed to do as well. Even in our giving, we are supposed to put first things first, which means that God comes first and everything else comes behind that. And so when we do that, we will be good stewards. We will be faithful stewards, as we see here in 1 Corinthians 4 and verse 2. We also find an example. We think about how all things are God's and we must be faithful stewards of those things. We have a good example of those who had a proper regard for their earthly possessions. In Acts chapter 4, we find that the church in Jerusalem sold and gave to the local church, and the attitude they have there, they display there, is one that is encouraging. Now we understand this is during the time we call the church in their infancy. We know it's not uncommon, though, for those today who have certain possessions that they just sell it, and they decide, you know what, we're going to give that to the local congregation, the, the funds from that. Uh, some will, uh, will do well throughout the year. Maybe they receive certain things from their uh, place in employment, and they either give those funds to the church, or maybe they sell it or whatever and give those funds to the church, whatever it may be. And so we find similar acts today being done still, as we find here in Acts chapter 4. Beginning in verse 32, the Bible says, Now the multitude of those who believed were of one heart and, uh, and one soul. That shows us the fellowship they enjoyed. To be of one heart of one soul is they had the same thing on their minds. 
to put God first, as we'll see next, also to help others who may be in need, and to help that new congregation that was uh, no doubt beginning there in Jerusalem. He says, Neither did anyone say that any of, th any of the things he possessed was his own. He says, But they had all things in common, which means no doubt they shared some things. And But also we see in verse 33 and following, the Bible says, And when the great, with great power the apostles gave witness to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and great grace was upon them all. That means what? God was pleased with them. God was blessing them. Verse 34, Nor was there anyone among them who, who lacked. For all who were possessors of lands, now notice he didn't say everyone, but those who were possessors of land, meaning those who had what? Things they could sell, they could afford to sell, things that wouldn't be no doubt detrimental if they sold. And those who were possessors of lands or houses sold them, and brought the proceeds of, of the things that they were that were sold, and laid them at the apostles' feet, and they distributed to each one as anyone had need. Those who what had the ability, because not all, he says, all who were possessors of these things, sold their lands and sold houses. And they did what? They brought their funds from those things and they gave them, the Bible says they laid them at the apostles' feet, showing they gave them to that local to that church, didn't they? Do you remember what happened when Ananias and Sapphira kind of had that same idea, but not really were truthful about it? In fact, they weren't. The Bible records how they uh, sold a possession, and but they held back a portion of it. And it came, and what happened? And they came to, into Peter. And Ananias stood before Peter, and Peter asked Ananias, you know, did you sell your land or this possession so much and he said he did and Peter replies why have you held back a portion of it you have not lied to me but to God and what Peter is showing is that these individuals in Ananias and Sapphira had the wrong attitude when it came to their possessions first of all I think it also shows a lack of trust they must have been worried or greedy to, in order to hold back a portion of which they have sold and so they brought a portion to uh, Peter, uh, Peter reminded them they had what? Obviously obligated themselves to give it all. And they had not, and we know the Bible tells us that Ananias and his wife Sapphira would breathe their last because they lied to God. And so it is vitally important that we also have a proper regard for our riches, for our blessings that God has given us. We may not drop down and breathe our last, but on the day of judgment, God will no doubt have us answer for those things. The Lord will have us answer for those things. And so let's move on to another point for us to consider. As we recognize that all things are God's and therefore we must be good stewards of our blessings which we have been blessed with from God. Let's consider another question. Why should a Christian give? A Christian should give because, first of all, his love for God's love for man should motivate us to give to God. We should remember that when we give, we're not just giving to the local congregation, we're also giving it to God. It is a form of worship to God. That's why it's one of our avenues of worship. In John chapter 3, and verse 16, we have a very simple verse to remind us of God's great love for man. When he says, For God to love the world, that gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. That type of love that God has for man should motivate us to have the right attitude and the right mindset when it comes time for us to give to the Lord. You know, if you think about that, we have to remember we're giving it to God. That's what Peter said when he talked to Ananias and Sapphira. They didn't lie to him. He said, you lied to God. And so we must remember we are giving back to God. So God's love should motivate us to give, to give with the right heart, with the right attitude. Another reason or something else that should cause that Christians should give is life, it's, life itself is from the Lord. We look at James chapter 4, verses 14 and 15. The Bible says, Whereas you do not know what will happen tomorrow, for what is your life? It is even a vapor that appears for a little time and then vanishes away. Instead, you ought to say, the Lord wills, we shall live and do this or that. James is pointing out that we do not know what tomorrow holds and that God decides when our life begins and he decides when our life comes to a close. 
And so for that reason, recognize that life itself is a gift from God. And those, that gift from God of life and of our health, whether it be good or maybe not so well, we should still give blessings to God and give thanks to Him. And so why should the Christian give? Because our life itself is from the Lord. Another reason we should give is because God's Word teaches us to give. We look at Matthew chapter 6 in verse 1 and following. The Bible says, Take heed that you do not do your charitable deeds before men to be seen by them. Now here he's talking about the idea of benevolence. But it's still giving though, isn't it? We have the same attitude. When we give back to the church here, we shouldn't do what? We shouldn't take out and show our big bills or a check or whatever it is real high and then drop it in the plate. That would be the same idea we find here in Matthew chapter 6. He says, Take heed that you not do your charitable deeds before men to be seen by them. Otherwise you have no reward from your Father in heaven. Therefore, when you do a charitable deed, do not sound a trumpet before you as the hypocrites do in the synagogues in the streets that they may have glory from men. As surely I say to you, they have their reward. We have to remember, when we give back, we need to have the right mindset. We shouldn't want others to find out what we are giving and so that we could try to find praise from them for what we are doing. That is a wrong attitude, isn't it? And it's not pleasing to God. Christ says here in Matthew, He says, Surely I say to you, they have their reward. But when you do a charitable deed, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing. That your terrible deed may be in secret, and your Father who sees in secret will himself reward you openly. Who needs to know who, who, what we are giving to God? Just us and God. Now we understand those who collect and, and, and collect those things to take and put those things in the bank may know. But you know what? It doesn't mean others should know, does it? We shouldn't commit those things to our memory. The point I'm making is when we give to God, give to the local congregation, it should be between us and the Lord. The Lord will decide if we are pleasing or not, not, not anyone else. And so we must make sure that when we give to, to the congregation in worship, we're not doing so to try to find greed or excuse me, try to find uh, praise from men for doing so. We, do, we give back and we find praise from God instead. We find that we are pleasing to God. Let's also notice that the Christians should give because the early church set an example of giving. 1 Corinthians 16, beginning in verses 1, looking at verse 2, the Bible says, Now concerning the collection for the saints, as I have given orders to the churches of Galatia, so you must do also. So he's talking about he has given orders to other congregations. Here he mentions specifically those in Galatia. And he says, You must do also. You follow this example. But what is that example? He says, On the first Day of the week, let each one of you lay something aside, storing up as you may prosper, that there be no collections when I come. What are they to do? They are to lay by and store and give on the first day of the week. And they are to do what? They are to do so, and we see on the first day of the week, and to do so as they have prospered. The Bible also says that they lay something aside, something that has been Many times it can be predetermined what we're going to give. But we know what we're going to make for the year. Different course, different employments. Maybe our, our salary changes every year based on, upon our performance. But we know that many times, at times, what our salary is going to be. So we can determine, I'm going to give this amount every week. And so we set that amount every aside every week and we give that to the Lord. We lay something aside. He says here in verse 2, storing up as he may prosper. There are those who do not prosper, and so they're not able to give back. We have those who are, who are not financially able to give back, and so they're unable to store up as they have prospered. Now we have looked at how all things are God's, and we must be faithful stewards of those things. We looked at some examples of why we should give, and we also want to consider how should the Christian give. Well, the Christian should give on a regular basis. We notice in 1 Corinthians 16, going back what we looked at a moment ago, how often are they to do so? The Bible says there in verse 2, on the first day of the week. Well, have, every week has the first day, doesn't it? And so on every first day of the week, we give back from the blessing which God has given us. How do we do so? We give as we have prospered. That is, as we work and labor and receive funds and payment 
We set aside and we give as we have prospered. And how are we to do so? When we have the ability, we are to do so liberally. That is, we are to give much. If we are able to give much, we should give much. We understand that everyone prospers differently, don't they? That's understandable. That's logical. But when we are able, we should, be, we should give in a liberal way. That is, freely. 2 Corinthians 9 and verse 6, he says, With this I say, he who sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. And he who sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. You know, it's sad if we are a member of a congregation and we are doing well, if we don't give as we really could give. Now think about it this way. If we gave to the full extent of our ability and really gave to the local congregation as we could, and everyone did that, that would change the whole brotherhood, wouldn't it? If everyone gave as they really, truly could, what would happen? Probably more missionaries would go out to the field, wouldn't they? More preachers would be able to be trained. And there would be, what, less reasons for why work is not being done. When we give, we're able to do more. We're able to do things because we give. We're able to support works because we give. When we do not do those things, well, those things come to an end. We also look at an attitude of giving. In the very next verse, we see we are to do so cheerfully. So let each one give as he purposes in his heart, not grudgingly or of necessity, for God loves a cheerful giver. When the contribution plate comes around, we shouldn't feel like I have to, fi- I have to do this. We should say, I look, I'm glad that I can do this. I'm glad that I can give a portion of what God has blessed me with. He says here in verse 7, So that each one gives as he, give as he purposes in his heart. That's talking about as we have determined already, predetermined. Not grudgingly or in necessity. Again, he's dealing with the attitude. We shouldn't be grudging or grinding our teeth when it comes time to give back. We should be cheerful and glad to do so. He says in verse 7, For God loves a cheerful giver. The Bible tells us over and over again that so long as we are faithful to God, we will be taken care of, won't we? It doesn't mean we'll have the best of everything, but it does mean that God will take care of us. Matthew chapter 6 and verse 33, the Bible tells us what? The seek, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you, which means that God, as we've seen in previous verses, will take care of us. Our food, our clothing, all those types of things, God will make sure that we are provided for. We also find another attitude. Do you think about how the Christian should give? In 2 Corinthians chapter 8 and verse 5, we find we give ourselves to God first and then to others second. Paul says here, and not only as we have had hoped, well, they first gave themselves to the Lord and then to us by the will of God. And then they first did again themselves to what? The work of the Lord, to perhaps giving of their means first to God, and then if they had ability to give to Paul after that. We must be willing to make sure we put God first and give to Him first before we do anything else. You know, at the beginning of every week, or maybe the end of every week when we get our paycheck, whatever it may be, we should sit down and decide what we're going to do with it. But God shouldn't be at the bottom, should He? He needs to be at the top. God doesn't give us what's left over, neither should we give Him what is left over either. Blessings are promised to those who are faithful stewards. Those who are faithful in what God has blessed them with, God is going to bless us as well. Acts 20 and verse 35 says, I have shown you in every way by laboring like this that you must support the weak. And remember the words of the Lord Jesus that he said, It is more blessed to give than to receive. We hear that so many times. We hear a lot of times around this time of year, don't we, with Christmas. It's, More blessed to give than to receive. Well, that should be our our mentality all the time. We we do much more good in the world by giving than we do by receiving. You know, I know every year, beginning about Thanksgiving, you have those bell ringers out from the Walmart. The Salvation Army, which, if you don't know this, is a denomination 
and they have on their sign, doing the most good. And they say that because they're helping others in need. And there's nothing wrong with helping others in need. What I have a problem with is the phrase, doing the most good, because when you're spreading denominational doctrine while you're helping others who are in need, you're not doing the most good. And so we must remember that we must be faithful stewards in what we have and must realize it is more blessed to give than to receive. But we must realize some are not doing it in a way that's pleasing to God. We must remember if we give to the Lord as we should, the Lord will take care of us. Luke chapter 6 and verse 38. The Bible says, Give, and it will be given to you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over will be put into your bosom. For with the same measure that you, you use it, you use, you, it will be measured back to you. As we give to God, He will bless us. As we make sure we put God first, we will be taken care of by God. This morning, as we prepare to close, we must remember we can give as we have prospered. When we give as we have prospered, we should remember we should do so to the very best of our ability. We give every week, but we have to ask ourselves, are we doing it to the very best of our ability? One last scripture reference for us to consider comes from Mark chapter 12, the widow and her two mites. Mark chapter 12, beginning in verse 41, the Bible says, Now Jesus sat opposite the treasury and saw, saw the people put money into the treasury. Now if anyone had the ability and the right to do so, it would be Christ. He says, And many who were rich, and many who were rich put, 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 into, put into much. Uh, then one poor widow came and threw in two mites, which make a quadrants. So he called his disciples to himself and said to them, Surely I say to you that this poor widow has put in more than, than, than all those who had given to the treasury, for they all put in out of their abundance, but she out of her poverty put in all that she had her whole livelihood. Christ is calling attention. He says, You see all these wealthy people putting in something? That doesn't, it doesn't affect them because they're wealthy. But he says, This poor widow put in two months. He says, That's all that she had. She puts forth a proper example. She didn't have much, but she still gave it to God. And so we must be mindful of that attitude to make sure that we have a similar attitude as well when it comes to our giving to the Lord. When we do what pleases God, then our hearts will be right before Him. When we do what is pleasing to Him. So let's remember these things as we think about our worship to God. Remember these basic facts that when we do these things and have the right attitude, when our heart is right, our attitude is right, our giving will be right as well. This morning, if we can help you any way, I think those who are here are uh, Christians, those who are of age, if we can help you any way, if you ask for prayers, uh, maybe repent of sins, whatever your need may be, we'd be glad to help you any way that we possibly can. That's going to be stand and sing the song that's been selected.